Welcome to the Behind the Curtain Podcast, your real-world guide to real estate investment and property management. In today's episode, I have Lindsay with me, one of the property managers here at Enterprise Property Management. Today we're going to be talking about the landlord onboarding process and what it takes to come on board with Enterprise, but what you should look out for with other property management companies should you be outside of the Memphis market. So Lindsay, good to have you on the show today. Good to be here. Uh, I'd just like to start with, could you just take a few minutes just to give an overview from start to end what to expect with the onboarding process and then we'll go into more detail step by step. Sure. There's a couple different ways that a house comes on board with EPM. It could be they already have a house in the Memphis market and they're wanting to switch management companies or they're buying a new house in the Memphis market for us to manage. They'll typically speak with one of our sales representatives if they're purchasing or with our principal broker, Aaron Ivey, to discuss the services that we offer. Once they have that discussion, talk about rent range if it's a new vacant property. The information then comes over to me and I get to type up all of the documents that we need to set them up with us in the system. Depending on if the house is vacant or occupied, there's a couple different ways it'll be handled, but I'm here to get all the forms that we need uh, loaded in the system and make sure that they're set up for success here. So you're the paper lady? Pretty much. I mean, I like to think I do more than that, but yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, that wasn't an insult. It was just a silly little joke. I'm fitted for this job just because I'm very detail-oriented, and so that's why Aaron's like, oh, no, you're going to follow up with them and, and get those forms. I'm like, absolutely. What are the steps once it comes over to you to get us to that end point? So it's a matter of us sending out a property management agreement, which will talk about the services that Enterprise offers and any fees associated with that. There will also be an owner's acknowledgement or responsibility acknowledgement, which kind of goes into their preferences for the property, how many uh, inspections they would like per year, whether they allow pets, if there's an irrigation system or pool, and what directions they want to give us on that. We'll also get their accounting information so we can set them up to receive their monthly disbursements, tax documentation for reporting at the end of the year. And then if it is occupied, then of course, we're going to want the tenant lease ledger and contact information so we can onboard the tenant. And lastly, the fund MLGW form. They need to set us up as authorized agents so that we can act on their behalf so they don't have to call. They just have to do that one call to get set up. And then after that, we completely take control of it from there. So I'll send all those documents out. Once they're returned, we'll get them loaded in the system and then move on to the next steps. What would the next steps be? It would actually be entering all the documentation into our two softwares. We use Property Boss for our accounting and we use Property Meld for our maintenance. We'll get them set up so they have portal access. They can see everything in real time, both from a maintenance and accounting standpoint. So there are no surprises. If it's vacant, then we'll set up a inspection with Randy, our maintenance supervisor. He'll look at the property, assess it for any repairs that need to be made to get it ready for the next tenant. And then we'll work our rent ready process where we order bids, we schedule the work, and then turn it over to leasing to have it rented out. If it is an occupied property, um, we still do an inspection because we like to know what the condition of the house is when we take possession of it. it kind of lets us know what was pre-existing when settling up a tenant security deposit. So we'll send the tenant a welcome letter, and then depending on the owner's preference, and it's part of the owner's responsibility acknowledgement form that we send out, whether they want to do a lease assignment, which is just saying, this is the active lease, we're signing it to EPM or if they want us to do a full EPM lease. And at that point, is is it all go or are there any more steps that need to happen before the tenant goes in? For the vacant one, leasing would go out and check, take photos for the website, get it you know listed on our syndicated sites and my Memphis rental, which is our homepage for all of our listings. They'll take photos, uh, write up the description, and hopefully get it rented out pretty quickly. And then it kind of comes back over to my department where we then interact with the tenant and any maintenance needs at the house. All right, let's go back to uh, step number one where you said someone from the sales team or they speak directly with Aaron about their property. Um, Let's talk about that process. What goes on in the detail of that process? If it's the sales team and they're looking for a house, the sales team will talk to them about, you know, 
what are you looking for as a return? Is there a certain area in Memphis that you know, you're know you gearing towards? That way they can look through available product to say, hey, I found the perfect fit for you. Then they'll go through the, the whole sales process. You know, They'll do the inspections, make sure everything is good to go for the closing. Again, there's two different ways to do that, whether or not it is occupied or vacant. They're handled two different ways. A few additional steps needed when it is occupied from a paperwork standpoint. And now if it's with Aaron, he's mostly talking about rent ranges with them because they've already they already have the house, usually when Aaron's talking to them. So if it's vacant, figuring out, okay, this is what we think we can get for it. Does that work for you? And then we move on to the next steps. At that stage, the property is presented to you. Correct. Uh, what details if the homeowner is working with you directly, what do they need to provide to you? The things that I need to start our process is what name they want the management to be under. Some people do it as an individual. Some people have it as an LLC. It's important that I know that on the front end for tax documentation purposes. Otherwise, we have to redo the contract when it gets changed. I need to know the name of the property, the property address, and then what day they want us to take over management. Now, in our contract, there will be times where you know, an owner may want to discuss with Aaron the fee structure. I can't discuss any of that because I'm not a licensed agent. So I feel that back over to Aaron. And then if it's occupied, that's when I'm typically going to ask for the tenant related stuff. Because again, it's two totally different approaches if it's occupied or vacant. So it's very nice to know that on the front end. If it's occupied, then of course, I'm going to want the tenant lease, ledger, contact information, and any additional information they could provide. I tend to ask for, I think, a little bit more than other companies do, but whenever a house unfortunately leaves us, I try to give them everything that I would want to have for a successful onboarding because it just makes it easier for the tenant. There's no reason for them to be inconvenienced because they didn't ask for the property to be transferred management. So I just try to make it as easy as possible for them too. So at this point, you then move on to the property management agreement. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for to be provided to you to accomplish that? Um, I actually have a little letter that I send out to them that kind of gives them point by point. So I'm going to look for a sign and completed property management agreement, a sign and completed owner's responsibility acknowledgement. That's the one that says if they want pets, irrigation system, pool, and termite contract. I'm going to need their direct deposit information for where they would like us to send their monthly disbursements for rent. 250 for their owner's reserve. We call that their maintenance escrow. We always keep $250 on hand at all times in case there's any minor repairs because I would hate to have to call an owner up every time there's like a $75 charge where we could just take care of it. I'm going to need keys for the property. I will also need, again, if it is occupied, all of the tenant related information and then the notarized MLGW form. And that is the only form that we have a lot of issues with, I guess I would say, because that's the one that needs to be notarized. Everything else can just be signed and sent back. But MLGW is very particular and understandably so. Um, They want the form to be notarized. And then I need the original actually mailed back to me. Everything else can be scanned to me electronically. But that one needs to be the actual form that I'll then make a copy for our file here and then mail the original over to MLGW. And that just sets us up as authorized agents to act on the owner's behalf with that property. For the listeners that are outside the Memphis market, MLGW is the utility company here in Memphis. So that's electrical, gas and water. You know, one of the things I found when I was reading about the onboarding process over the last few weeks in preparation for today's show, a lot of people talk about an incubation period. But it just means a period of time where you can get used to concepts and ideas. How much of that is built into the process? And from start to end, how quickly could the onboarding process take and how long does it typically take? Uh, It depends on each situation. I can have a house onboarded in less than a day. There are times where I get kind of a a last minute call. Hey, so I just closed on this house. We want to use you for management. And so, of course, my mind's scrambling and I'm like, okay, let me get you the documents. They can get the documents back to me same day. I can get everything loaded in the system and we can start you know, reaching out to the tenant or doing the inspections if it's vacant. The sales team, usually as soon as there's a contract on a house and they know that they're going to be using Enterprise, they'll send me an email and say, hey, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. They're getting a house on this at this property and they're closing on this date. I'll go ahead and, and type up the contracts, you know, get my new property process started and send it out to them. As soon as they can get it back to me, I can get everything loaded in the system. My preference, the sooner they get them back, the better, because that way everything is in the system. And as soon as the sales team tells me it's closed, 
If it's vacant, I'm calling MLGW to transfer utility services and setting up the inspection. If it's occupied, I'm sending out the new pro. Uh, welcome letter uh, to the tenants, just kind of letting them know who we are and how to get in touch with us. That way, if they have a maintenance issue or anything like that. So yeah, if they can get that back to me as soon as possible, because it it can be stressful when multiple houses are closing the same day and the owners wait until it officially closes to send the documents over. It gets a little crazy in my office. I just close my door and kind of fire through everything. So I always encourage owners, you know, as soon as you've done the inspection and you know the house is going to be closing, go ahead and send those documents over. If for some reason something ends up falling out with the contract, I can just simply delete it from the system. No harm, no foul. And it'll definitely streamline the process if we have it sooner. So we've been talking about two different cases there where there's the occupied property Mm -hmm. and there's the unoccupied property. In one capacity or another, the occupied property has had some kind of management, whether that's a company or an individual. Correct. Which of the two is a quicker process or is, is there no distinction between the two? I haven't really observed a distinction between the two, between a self-managed property or a management company. With management companies, we tend to get more complete forms that help us with our process. A lot of times when it's a an owner managing it, they might not necessarily keep like a defined ledger. So it's kind of hard to gauge whether or not the tenant, you know, has repeated late pays or, or something of that nature. But in regards to the closing process, there really isn't much of a difference. It's just different on the paperwork that we're receiving. So it sounds like with the detail and the organization of working with a property management company, it would be simpler on the owner to transfer in from that circumstance than coming to you brand new. It, it is. Um, and that way, if they're working with another management company, I just call up that company and say, hey, so I'm missing X, Y, and Z. When it is an owner self-managing and it's selling to one of our investors, I then have to go through the sales team and then their realtor to get the information because I won't have access to that information. When it's a management company, I'll have a lease. And so I'll know the name of the company and I can just Google it and call them and say, hey, so we're taking over management of XYZ property. I got this and this from closing, but it looks like I'm missing this. Is there any way that you could send that over to me? And anytime we have a transfer coming in or a transfer leaving us, I always try to foster really good relationships with the other management companies because you never know when you may need to ask them a question in the future. So, Yeah, never burn bridges. Never, never. And so there's a few uh, ladies that I actually have their email addresses saved. And even if they're not the one I'm directly working with for a transfer, I know I can still reach out to them and say, hey, I'm still waiting on this. Is there anything you can do to help me out? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. And they'll send it right over. If you've not been to our website, the property management website is property management memphis.com i don't think you'll have difficulty remembering that one you can go there you can find out our fee structure you can also find out about the various people that work for enterprise property management and if you'd like to speak to someone at enterprise property management please give us a call at 901-260-0206 and you can reach the property managers on option three Mm -hmm. if you're looking to transfer your management over from another company within the memphis area we'd love to hear from you So at Enterprise, you have an inspection program. Mm -hmm. Is that optional or is is it something they must do? It's optional. So we have a couple different tiers. We recommend at least having one or two inspections. So you can sign up for annual, semi-annual, quarterly, or you can decline. I always recommend at least one. Now, if a tenant renews, we automatically do an inspection during the renewal process. But without doing at least one inspection and say the tenant stays month to month, we're not documenting the condition of the home and most of our owners aren't local. Um, So having that interval inspection done, it's getting eyes on the property. It's reporting any issues, whether interior or exterior. It could shed light on if there's a pet at the property that's not been acknowledged previously or paid for or excessive damage to the property. We've had a couple instances recently where we've done an interval inspection and the house was definitely not being kept well and It was presented to the owner and the owner says, you know what, it's time for them to go. And so then, you know, we send a a letter asking them to vacate the property due to damages. So at least having one or two inspections, I I think is 
great. If you sign up for semi-annual, I always try to do one in the spring and then in the fall. That way they're able to look at the AC, see if there's any issues, see if it needs to be cleaned before cooling season starts. And then again, in the fall before heating season starts. So most of our owners do semi-annual. Very few have declined. And we can change that frequency at any time. So if you know that you have a good tenant from the inspections that you've had and said, you know what, I think I can back off to doing this once a year. You just send me an email, let me know. I change it in the system and we, we can go from there. Or if you see issues in an inspection and you're on annual and you want to have it checked out more frequently, we can change it to quarterly. It's just as simple as sending an email in. From a marketing perspective, when I, I'm looking at pictures for properties and what message are we sending with those pictures? You know, is it an accurate portrayal of the property? I tell people, look up, look down, look around, and yeah. then look inside. And that's exactly what you must do when a property management company provides you with the initial pictures of the property quality. Determine for yourself whether it, it covers everything that you want to see and whether it shows you in enough detail what you want to see. If not, ask them for more pictures. Exactly. So let's talk about the, the initial baseline inspection that, in our case, Randy would go out and do. Have you come across anything really funny or something extremely unusual? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there have been a few instances where we found squatters at a property and then had to call the police to get them out of, I think it was a, a, an exterior garage, like the garage wasn't attached to the house. So yeah, that, that was an interesting experience and I'm sure startled him coming across that. Unfortunately, if it's a, been a vacant house and it's been vacant for a while, critters, we had a raccoon situation where it was still in the house. There's some different things that he can find. There was an instance where we were told the property was vacant and it wasn't. The tenant was still there. So that was a miscommunication during the sales process relaying over to us that the house was in fact still occupied. The tenant was supposed to be out two weeks prior and, and hadn't left yet and they didn't verify. So Paul was very surprised on that one because he went to go drop off the lockbox at the house. So, But when Randy goes out to do an inspection, again, like you said, all around, inside, Randy is actually a retired um, Memphis firefighter. So his big thing is safety. He wants to make sure windows open so people can get out in the event of a fire, working smoke and COs, um, if gas is present. And again, he's looking at it from that MHA standpoint too. Like what are safety concerns, you know, that a government agency would have? We definitely need to make sure to notate that. And then he'll briefly touch on the cosmetic. I don't actually get to go out in the field to look at the properties. So I rely on Randy and then Jody's also another one of our inspectors here. And they take a whole ton of pictures and we will gladly share those with owners, you know, so they can see the condition of the house because they may only see what is photo during the home inspection process. So I have no problem sending those over. Randy sometimes takes close to 200 uh, photos. So uh, few emails sending those over, but it gives them a good idea of what the condition of the house is. Because sometimes when you get the bids to get the house ready, it's like, well, is this really necessary? Yeah, let me send you some pictures. And they see it and they're like, yes, we absolutely need to address the exterior paint. So yeah, we're, we're very good here about taking photos and supporting the, the bids. You know, we're not going to try to have you spend money on stuff that's not necessary. Now, we may alert you to an issue like exterior paint. Hey, you may not need to do it right now, but let's start budgeting for that for next year because, you know, it's just it's going to get worse if it's not addressed. In the cases where someone has been squatting or, you know, a tenant has overstayed their welcome and effectively become a squatter as well, mm -hmm. Is that something that you handle in the process or is that something that the owner needs to fix before you can work up a property management agreement? Oh, no, the, the property management agreement will already be in place before Randy actually goes out to the property. There's only been, I think, maybe a couple instances where we've sent someone out before a house is closed and that was just to put eyes on the property. With the instance where the tenant was still in the property, there was a written agreement between the seller and the tenant to be out of the property by a certain date and it just wasn't followed up on to make sure they were out before closing. 
So we got that documentation from the seller that says, yes, I am out of this property. Yes, anything that is remaining in this property can be disposed of because there was a lot of personal stuff left in the house. And we definitely don't want to be put in a position where we're unlawfully disposing of somebody's belongings. We waited about a week and we went back and confirmed that they were out and then proceeded. Now, with the squatter situation, it was an exterior garage. The police escorted them out. Again, we were already in management of the property. And I believe Randy and Paul were both present for for that particular instance. And then Paul just changed the locks and made sure that everything was secured. I think he may have even put in a couple boards so that it couldn't get opened again until we could do the necessary repairs. What would you say is the greatest mismatch between the expectation of someone coming on in the onboarding process and the reality of managing a property? The one misconception that there may be is the management team looks at things through different eyes than maybe the homeowner or the sales team would. So when they're looking at a property for what needs to be done, we're looking through it as a tenant living in the house, not as a property being sold. So there may be some more items that are a little more detailed that we're looking for, because I have to take into consideration what the leasing is going to come back with. I'm a mom, and so I'm looking at a house, okay, would I feel comfortable with my three-year-old with something exposed? And then dealing with MHA, which is the Memphis Housing Authority, um, Section 8, they have a certain set of standards too. So whenever I look at a house, I'm looking at all three of those things, which may be very different than what the homeowner had in mind when they purchased the property. So we're trying to work with the sales team a lot to let them know, hey, so these are some of the things that we're looking for. I hate for any owner to be completely blindsided when they say, oh, the house is ready to go. And then I come back with $1,000 worth of work that needs to be done. So that, I guess I could say is a little bit of a, a mismatch there, but we're, we're working towards streamlining lining that as best as possible. The other thing is owners tend to think when they onboard with us that I'm the only one they talk to. And we kind of do things differently at Enterprise than other companies. A lot of other companies, you'll have a set property manager that that is that one person that you deal with for everything. EPM, we're kind of a we're more of a team. And so while I handle onboarding, once the house is in the system, we have it rented, we have the tenant in there, any three of the property managers may be interacting with them. And so I actually had a phone call with a homeowner yesterday and he's like, so are you who I call anytime I have a question? I was like, you can always reach out to me with any question you have. If I don't have it, I'll redirect it. But as tenants start putting in maintenance requests, the other girls are going to be reaching out to you and they'll be the person that you're going to want to talk to about that particular maintenance request or, you know, accounting issue or or anything like that. I'm always available. I kind of, you know, handhold and walk them through the process, make sure that they're comfortable with our company and ask any of the questions they have on the front end. So hopefully there won't be any surprises down the road. I think that's good advice for any business transaction, no matter who you're doing a transaction with, the question of who will I be dealing with Mm -hmm. over the course of this contract. Exactly. That's a very good question to ask and perhaps one of the most upfront questions you should ask. Yeah. I guess the main things to look for when looking for a management company, transparency and customer service. Those are two things that we pride ourselves on. If you ever have any questions about accounting, you know, we will work through it with you. If you have any questions about a recent inspection, we document everything. A lot of it is getting a good feel for the people that you're talking to. You want to know that you can trust them with your business because most people, when they buy real estate for an investment, it's to go towards retirement. You know, they're, they're not looking for, you know, this as their day-to-day thing. This is something to prepare them for their future. So transparency is very, very important. And just knowing that you can you can trust the, the company that you're working with. You want to be able to have your, your questions answered. So during the onboarding process, ask any question that you have. Um, and between Aaron and I, we can answer, you know, all of them. You may have to look up some of them depending on how unique the, the question is. But we, we want to be upfront about everything. We don't want there to be any surprises. When I first started here, we just had the property management agreement. That was it. And I think it was like a four-page doc when I started. I think we're up to six pages now on that. We also came up with the owner's responsibility acknowledgement because everything was verbal before. It's like, okay, well, do you want pets or not? no pets? And, you know, we had to kind of let them know what pets we allow and whether or not there was a pool or irrigation system. Sometimes that's not something addressed during a home inspection. So we need 
well, I mean, obviously you'll know if there's a pool, but like the irrigation system, like do they have a company that they use? Termite contract. Is there a company that they already have a contract with? Because we definitely want to carry that over. So just make making sure that you're asking the questions and if something doesn't feel right, back out. One of the ways in which you can get to know us here at Enterprise is EPM Real Estate has an investor summit. We've had one so far and it looks like we're going to end up having them every six months or every quarter. And we do have one coming up later in the year. This is an opportunity for investors who already invest with Enterprise or people who have no clue about investing. Just come along, get to know us, get to know the Memphis market and have an opportunity to talk to other investors about their experiences and what they've found in the Memphis market. It's a great way to learn about the marketplace and how you should be approaching the whole investment process. Yeah, I was able to sit in on a little bit of the summit that they had here at the office. And it was nice because I actually got to put a face with the name of, because there's, I think, at least two investors that had just recently onboarded with us and have bought additional houses since that summit. So it, it was nice just to kind of have that personal connection. They came into my office, asked a few questions. It's very much an open door policy here. You know, you got a question, come on in. So that that was really neat. And I think we even ab- obtained an additional EPM investor from that summit. I mean, it, it was really neat just to be able to meet, you know, a couple of the guys. And we actually had a real time incident while they were here like one of the owners the shower was leaking and we'd had ongoing issues and I just I took Jody's phone I ran up the stairs and I was like hey Garrett he's like yeah I was like I need to talk to you about your house he's like what do you got and I showed him the picture he's like oh no (laughs) oh you know one of the funniest conversations I had with actually several of the investors was you know it's great being here this is the first time I've seen Memphis it's the first time I've seen my properties I know they do everything like sight unseen so they're really they really have to trust the people that they're working with so you know with us we document everything I'm not sure so much on the sales side what all they get to see during that process, just because I don't see the front end of it. I only see it after a decision has been made. So I'm kind of interested to to know what what they see on the front end and then what new information they find out once they come on with us. Well, it's been great talking to you today about the uh, property management onboarding process, and uh, I hope it's been an education for our listeners. Thank you for listening to Behind the Curtain Podcast, your real world guide to real estate investment and property management. Be sure to subscribe at BehindTheCurtainPodcast.com. And if you'd like to learn more about Enterprise Property Management's real estate services, please visit us on the web at EPMRealEstate.com. This has been a Sound Ideas Group production for Enterprise Property Management, Inc.